Okay, now you came here for screencasting, but I'm going to give you more. I'm going to show you Socrative. Has anybody ever heard of Socrative.com? All right, this is kind of like you're going for an oil change and now they're trying to sell you a new car. This is my little uh, thing in the beginning I like to do. I'm so in love with this tool, with what it can do. Um, in place of the, our school invested about, I think it was about $1,600 for a class set of clickers. Is anybody familiar with clickers? Student response systems, they're more technically called. Well, those things that you buy that are $1,500 to $1,800 per class set, a lot of money, do one thing and one thing only, and that's just respond to teacher questions. It takes a little bit of uh, knowledge on the teacher's part to learn the whole system and how do I put in questions, and so it's difficult. It's not something you jump into you know, on, on next week. So get rid of all that idea, and now we have this, this uh, service called Socrative. It is a free service. And it works with any mobile device, anything that has a browser on it. So a laptop, a desktop, a smartphone, an iPod Touch, a Kindle, Fire, anything that has a browser will work with this system. So now you can have kids bring stuff into the classroom, or maybe the district owns some stuff, or a mix of both. I've done it that way, where I, had, I have 10 iPod Touches that are owned by the school, but I have 20-some kids in class. So the rest of them that have their own iPod Touches, they bring those in, and we just give them the Wi-Fi uh, availability, uh, capacity for that. So we're all able to respond to questions and things like that. So I want to demonstrate it now as a kind of an opening initial thing to get information from you guys. And it's basically having you take a quiz, a pre-quiz, on what I'm going to show you today. And we're going to use the Socrative site to do that. Um, what I need to do is go to my teacher login. And I've already signed up for the service. So that's, that's one step taken care of at this point already. And once we are logged in, this, by the way, is easily done on a mobile device as well. So I could do this from my smartphone. They've designed the, the interface to be, um, these, of course, would be narrowed in much more. But they make it very easy to just be very touch sensitive. There's no drop downs or ex extensive ways to access it. So I have a made my room number to be Tech 110. You guys are going to need to know that in a few moments here. So T-E-C-H 110, all lowercase, no spaces. I'm going to invite you into my room which is basically my virtual classroom right now. Um, on your mobile devices, and I'm going to do it here using what's called incognito mode. Does anybody, everybody know what that is? Something somebody showed me, and I, now I'm really impressed with it. Sometimes you're logged into, your, say, your Gmail account, you're logged into some service, but you want to log in again as a different user. Well, you can't do that when you're using the same browser unless you use the little trick. It's up here by the wrench. This is Google Chrome, by the way, the Chrome browser. But I think all the browsers have this. It's called incognito mode. That means I can still be using the same browser twice, being logged in to two different services. So this is like as if I'm on a totally separate computer right now. It's called m.socrative.com. M stands for mobile. If you guys go there now with your whatever mobile device you have, it's going to look like this. And you can do this from your uh, smartphones if you have them as well. m.socrative.com. And you're simply going to be asked for the room number. So all you have to type in is Tech 110. T-E-C-H 110. And then you've joined the room. And I like that because there's no lengthy sign-up procedure, no usernames and passwords to use. It's just simply a room number that you can give out verbally and say it. And you can, by the way, pick your own room number. They give you a random one in the beginning, but I actually teach in room 110 at Amherst Middle School, so I, I chose Tech 110. So let's see now if you guys are in, because I'll have on my teacher dashboard. It looks like six of you are in the room, seven of you are in the room right now. And I can see that as you guys are getting into the room, the number increases right here. So we have, I know we have more than seven in the room. I'll, I'll give you another moment here to, to do that. Is everybody finding it okay? Anybody? Yeah, if you got to have Wi-Fi going, so that's the one. This could be any browser, by the way, too. It doesn't necessarily have to be Chrome. So any browser, any phone, as long as it has a browser, you, you can go to m.socratum.com. And there is an iOS app free and an Android app for free as well. So if you want to live in the world of apps, you can do that as well. So it's uh, basically the same exact thing you're seeing here, though. Um, so there are iOS and Android apps available as well. So I got 10 of you guys in the room right now, so I think that's good. We'll, we'll progress now. Um, I am tomorrow, I think it's tomorrow afternoon, I'm doing a two-hour workshop on Socrative. So if you're interested in this little teaser that I'm giving you here, see if you can come back for that as well if you'd like uh, tomorrow, because I'll dig in deep to all the different features here. But basically what I'm going to do right now is run a teacher-led, a teacher-paced quiz. 
and I've prepared one in advance. This one's called the, what are we doing? We're doing screencasting right now. And I'm gonna do teacher paste. So teacher paste means I'm gonna control the flow of the seven questions I'm gonna be asking you, rather than tell you you have independent work time to do the seven questions on your own. So on your screen, it should have come up right now. It hopefully did. And it's asking you question number one, please enter your last name and first name. And as you do that, I shall be seeing them up. Yep, there's the results coming up on the screen now. And what's really cool is once you've done this once or twice with students, they know what to do. And you can just start teaching right away. And they're in the room. They got their name in, and they're ready for question number two. So it's kind of like becomes very routine uh, once, once you've done this a few times. So you can see we got the names in there. I can see I could hide this, by the way, too. If I didn't want the class to see who's logged in and who's answering which way, I could just simply shut the uh, projector off and look at it only on my screen here. I yes? Can you do that? Um, yes, because if you're in a computer lab, all of the computers are hardwired to the internet, and you, you could do that. Okay. You just don't have the added advantage of having wireless devices. If kids have their own smartphones that have their own data plan, then they're all set as well, because you don't need the Wi-Fi. So, but in my case, teaching middle school, most kids have an iPod Touch, and they need the Wi-Fi, so we have to give them that in order to use it. So that is one catch to it all. All right, I am ready to send the first question to you guys. So I click my button that says, Send Next Question to Students. And you shall see in a moment here uh, question number two. And if you don't know, I believe I even had a choice that says I don't know. You can, you can guess if you don't know. So it's okay not to know right now. This is meant to be a pretest. In my results, let's see. And the results are coming in live right now. Looks like majority are answering screencast we have a screenshot and we have an unsure and don't know now keep in mind too this could influence you if you have not voted yet you as a classmate might be looking oh looks like <laughs> looks like that's the right answer I think I'll go for that so you may decide as they give you the button to hide live results until it's time to reveal them so that that's a consideration there too so it looks like mostly everybody got that one right there it is a screencast that is the correct answer to that question question number three now she'll be coming to your screens momentarily And it looks like results are coming in now. And the majority are getting that one right. That's right. A screenshot is a still photograph, a non-moving photograph. That's what we call a screenshot. And even though people are still answering, watch this. I could say, too late, moving on to the next question, and it'll refresh your screen automatically. So you, ha as the teacher paste control, you have control of uh, the answers there or uh, uh, the pace of the questions. So question number four is who can and should make screencasts? And sometimes like this it hides the, I think when you type in a lot of words there it kind of hides what's there that doesn't show up. But that choice is the one, looks like everybody's answering, answering it's unanimous. The answer is everybody. Everybody can create screencasts. It's not just the teacher, but it's also the student. It could be administrators. It could be the IT staff with a routine thing of how to do something that they say over and over and over again. You can save your, uh, save your breath that way and make one screencast and reuse it over and over again. My next question is, what devices can you use to make screencasts? I may have hinted at that a little bit before, too. And all of these are correct. That is true. You can use desktops, laptops, tablet computers, which are kind of the fun way to do things because of the touch interface. Uh, even smartphones can make small rudimentary screencasts, especially if it's just drawing things on the screen or annotating things. The next question is question number six. Which of these would be the most effective way to teach something when you're not face-to-face? -face? <laughs> This one might be a little, I bet you it's going to be unanimous. <laughs> but I've asked this question when I'm not doing a screencasting workshop, too. And I've had, 
uh, like at faculty meetings and, and getting kind of results across the board. But here, of course, it's everybody knows the screencast. It's kind of a loaded question. That's what we're here for to learn. Screencast, you can hear the person talking. You can hear the inflection in their voice. You can see what they're trying to draw your attention to. They can shade out certain portions of the screen so your attention is drawn directly to something. And it's digital, so you can play it anytime, anywhere, on any device. And so that is the answer to that one. And I believe this may be the final question. How do you envision using screencasts in your classroom? So this one is, is this the open-ended one? Yes, this is an open-ended question. So even though I haven't shown you anything yet in terms of making a screencast, from what we've talked about so far, I want to see kind of the, the vision that you might have of how you might use it for the uh, content that you teach. This was also done so I could show you that it's not just multiple choice. But when you use this tool, you could have open-ended response type questions too. Really good for brainstorming. When you have it put on names in that so you can keep track of who's because then you can just go right yes. down and figure out why you do that. Yep, when I finish this question, as you'll see, it'll ask me do I want to download or email a report? And I'll just hit email and then I'll get a nice spreadsheet of all the results of what everybody said. And No, nope. this is meant to be on the fly. Okay. They, they identify themselves as, at the beginning of the event. And there's a whole bunch of nice feedback. This way you as the audience can see what everybody else is thinking. And to you all, it's anonymous. So you can feel comfortable saying something that you might normally, I'm thinking middle school kid, might be like, ooh, I don't want to raise my hand and say that out loud. But at least this way they can say it. Everybody gets the essence of what's going on. And it's not identified on the screen of who said what. Now another tool, a way to use uh, Socrative is when you're brainstorming, you can actually, I can hit a button and then these will all become choices of a vote. And then you and the audience would be able to pick one of your favorite and it would rank them from top to bottom. I like that for brainstorming. Like what's the, uh, the best question for Friday's quiz? Create one. And then everybody creates one. And we say, okay, now let's vote on them. And the one that gets the most votes goes on the quiz. You know, just a quick way to, to brainstorm and then rank uh, things up on the Socrative screen. All right, so that is my little pre-demonstration of using the Socrative tool. Thank it's you. It's your welcome packet for oh, okay. presenting. Okay. okay. Do you have any questions? No, I think we're doing good. Okay. Thank you. So uh, that is my little pre-test. Gives you a little bit of a heads up on what we're covering today. And as you can see, when I'm done, it says, what do you want to do? I'll say email report. And that way, it'll send an email to me with all the results in it, and I can check that out later during my planning period if this was a school day. So I really like the Socrative tool. I only came across it about two months ago. And uh, when I was creating the outline for today's um, session, I wanted to make sure I could cover that real briefly in all of the workshops so everybody could see that. So we define screencast. It's a video. And screenshot is a photo. If you have this open and you want to see that, I actually give you just a, a Wikipedia definition for it. Um, these, the term screenshot has been around for many, many years. But screencast is more of a uh, re relatively new phenomenon with the ability to record a person's voice talking and record whatever's happening on the screen, much like I'm doing actually right now, recording the screen as, as we're going. Um, now for some teacher examples. Uh, demonstration of survey results. All these have a little story that goes along with them. And this one was, the story behind this is, in the beginning of every school year, um, I want to uh, figure out for my students who has what, who's got five iPads at home and who's got nothing and who's somewhere in between. So I create a little survey that I have them take online, and then they're always curious, well, how did everyone else answer? And rather than me giving them the results and saying, well, Johnny said this and Susie said that, I don't want to give that information to them, I made a little screencast video that showed them the results, and I was able to control what information they were receiving. And this video actually then was watched by other teachers in the building saying, oh, I didn't know that so many of our kids had this device. That means I could do this type of activity in class because they have iPod touches. And we can make videos or we can make podcasts. Um, so this kind of helps inform the, the culture, the community of what devices everybody has. So a, a screencast like this, I used Jing. And Jing is a free product that you can use made by the TechSmith company. Um, I'll be covering... I'll do a demonstration with Jing in a little bit so you can see that. Jing allows you to record your webcam in here if you're using Jing Pro. And that involves a little bit of cost. That's $15 a year. But just about a couple months ago, I found out that Jing is no longer going to be offering the Jing Pro service because they're kind of 
abandon, well, I shouldn't say abandoning that software, but they're focusing their efforts more on Snagit. <coughs> Snagit is the, if there's good, better, and best, the good would be Jing, the better would be Snagit, and the best would be Camtasia. And we're talking free, $30, $180 for the three tiers there. I'm kind of getting away from talking about Jing now because I'm, I'm not using it. I prefer to tell everybody, go for the $30 one. It's worth the $30. Even if it's your own, out of your own pocket, the $30 of your school is not going to pay for it. It does so many more things that Jing really can't do. One of the big ones being the amount of time you're allotted. In Jing, you can have up to five minutes of video. For some people, that's a big deal, and for some others, it's not. But with Snagit, it's unlimited, so you can have unlimited length of video. Snagit also allows you to upload directly to YouTube and put your videos up there, where Jing doesn't really have that ability, the free version of Jing. So I made this uh, in September, September, October-ish, back when I was using Jing. And you can see that I did have the uh, webcam built into it. And I think it's more of a psychological thing. When you can see the person that's talking to you, you feel more connected, like my teacher's actually teaching me something, rather than some voice that's in the distance that you can't see the face from. Um, I kind of experienced that myself being, uh, I just finished here at Canisius, um, took me about two years, the online master's in educational um, leadership and uh, administration. And some of my professors used this where I could see them and hear them and I felt more connected to them where others didn't. And I, it, to me, it was more like, you know, I felt more of a, a connection to the class when I could see the person talking. So I, I think speaking from a firsthand experience, it does offer a benefit. If you can feel comfortable enough to put yourself in it by using a webcam, it adds to the, uh, the overall feeling and tone of the class. Junior, I'd like to do a student survey just to see what kind of technology tools that the students have access to. And so this year I was a little bit surprised. Some of the numbers have gone up quite tremendously from June when I did this last through now September. So I had about 92 students take this survey. So I'm just going to pause it there. So what I do in the video is I is I go through the stats of how people answered, and I make sure I don't reveal any students' names so I can control the uh, having it be anonymous, the results. And this one happened to be about four minutes long. So in four minutes, because all the teachers say, I'm busy, I don't have a lot of time, but I say, well, if you got four minutes, you can watch and see what a lot of our eighth graders have, the availability of stuff at home, what kind of internet provider do they have at home, if at all, or where do they go to get online, or what devices do they have access to. So a screencast, I thought, was a better way of doing this rather than just giving raw data results. It's kind of like saying, here's a PowerPoint slideshow, and here's a recording of me presenting the PowerPoint. You know, it adds more liveliness to it when it's done in a uh, screencast fashion. Um, another one I have is, speaking of narrated PowerPoint slides, we had one of our grad school projects in Canisius was create a PowerPoint presentation in a group with, of course, people that you don't see because people are all over the country uh, in, in the Canisius program. And we each had, uh, I think, five slides to do. And the theory was present this. But we don't meet in a class like this face to face. So how are you going to present it? Well, I used an app called Explain Everything. <coughs> that is a $3 app. It's one of my favorites uh, for the iPad. And Explain Everything lets you record PowerPoint slides, hand drawings, uh, annotations, anything. And the microphone's always on while you're recording. So now I could use little arrows and things and point to things on the screen as I'm talking about uh, certain bullet points and such. And so this is a quick, easy way to get your PowerPoints in a video presentation type format. So I'll play a couple moments of this so you can see the, the idea behind this. Hello, this is Rob Sergeski, and my presentation is on mobile learning devices for educational use. My overall goal or mission or vision, whatever you'd like to call it here, is to provide a relevant 20%. So the theory is each slide is a separate recording incident. So if I had slides one through five, I would record myself five times, give the project to someone else, they record their voice for five times, give it to someone else, and it's all done digitally through the app. It's a um, explain everything file format, so it only works within the Explain Everything app, but you can easily export that out to someone through email or through Dropbox service. Does anybody use Dropbox? Familiar with Dropbox? Dropbox is like an online storage uh, location, and you can, it works across many different devices, Mac and PC and iPads. Um, so that's a way to, to share the project, give it to someone else. My classroom connection to this, maybe more of a primary connection, would be for uh, each of these slides would be a page of a book. And maybe each child would read a page of the book, give the iPad to the next person. They would record their voice on that page and give it to the next person and go around that way. Um, with the Explain Everything app, you can use not just PowerPoint slides, but it's basically a white canvas, a, a drawing screen. So you could draw with your finger. You could grab pictures from websites and put them on there. 
You could use the built-in camera on the device and take a picture of the child and now have them talk about themselves or write something on the screen. And go to the next child, take a picture, they write something on there. So you could have kind of a progressive uh, screencast, if you will, uh, using the Explain Everything app and do something like this, where you have many slides that are all strung together in one video that's available on YouTube or on a blog or wherever you'd like to put it. Um, and so that is a PowerPoint idea, but could also work with others. Provide and receive tech support. Another teacher example here. All right, let me refresh my memory and see which one I put here. Okay, this one was for um, a tool we use called Edmodo. Huh? Is anybody familiar with Edmodo? Okay, good. We've got a few people here that are. Edmodo is basically like Facebook. How many are familiar with Facebook? Everybody knows that one. Facebook is, of course, wide open. It's anything goes. It's not very controllable from a teacher classroom standpoint. So the developers of Edmodo, which is actually my afternoon presentation, uh, 2R01, I think, in this room also, is Edmodo is a platform. It's like Facebook, but it has teacher controls in it. It has things that Facebook doesn't, like a grade book and the ability for teachers to control um, posts and delete posts and, and, and have more control, basically, is what it's about. So a lot of our teachers started now from the grassroots level using Edmodo. They didn't ask administrators if they could do it. They didn't look for an official stamp of approval from the school to say, use this tool for it. They started using Edmodo just like I did and realized that this thing can grow. And now we basically, my students live inside of Edmodo. They turn in their assignments, they ask questions, they critique each other's work, they see each other's work, um, and it becomes an online platform for us to use. Now, the reason I'm telling the story is there's a fifth grade teacher, and I teach in the middle school, and John Herzog was actually uh, presenting, I think, later today, too. He was using the tool in, in, at Smallwood at one of our elementary schools, and the theory was, how do I show him something without being next to him? Because it's the kind of thing where I just can't explain it over the phone, and typing up an email like step one, step two would, would probably get someone lost with the, the amount of things that I had to cover with it. So my theory was, okay, let's put on the headphones and create a little screencast and then send him the link. And the link you just send, which is this link right here, you just sent the link in an email. He opens it, watches it, and understands exactly what the, the teaching point was going to be. Turns out a lot of other teachers wanted to use this tool too, and then John can just forward this link on to them, and it just grows and grows and grows. So you kind of spread the knowledge around that way without having to have people take time out of their day to stop and show you something step by step um, if that's not... Uh, essentially needed. Now, this step, I'm going to show so you let's see what this was. So let me stop it there. Imagine if I tried doing that in an email. Step one, find the button at the top. What button? What's it look like? Where do I go? Then click on the school tube icon. Was it the button? Is it the logo? What do I click on? Is a lot of like where do I go next kind of thing if you do it the traditional way. Doing it through a screencast though, you're hearing the person talk, you're seeing exactly where to go, and I think it's a much easier way to communicate. Plus, I like it because it's quicker. It takes me more time to write up an email or to get on the phone and find where our schedules meet up together and do that. This way I do it whenever, even when students are in my room and they're working on projects, I can be creating screencasts for them or for another student in another class and um, be able to communicate back and forth that way digitally because then it's there when you need it. And it's when you're ready to learn something, it, it's, it's there for you at that point. Not you need to learn it now, so you have to pay attention now and you've got to make sure you're 100% watching what I'm doing. This way it kind of offers the anytime, anywhere pace of learning, which is really what that whole flipped classroom idea was about too, where now it's just not, you know, second period on Tuesday is when we're going to learn how to do fractions. Now it can be, I did my teaching. You can watch it then, but you also could watch it at other times too. And maybe you can watch with this new math that's going on. I'm a, a, a father of a soon-to-be first grader. I'm told that math is a lot different from when we went through and learned math. So um, my theory was I thought, well, what if the teacher is making, or even better, the student is making in-class screencasts and puts them on this digital platform like, like Edmodo or someplace online, then the parent at home, when they want to help their child, they can go and see exactly how to do it. They can hear the teacher's voice or the student's voice and actually see what's going on. Because otherwise, without that, I don't know what other <coughs> method you would use to convey such intricate information that way without being able to watch it in a video. So that was the story behind this one. It was to show John and, and, and other teachers how to put videos uh, in their Edmodo page, stuff the kids were making and, and as you can see, there, there's a lot of more steps here involved after that point. 
and making the screencast was the quickest way and I think the most effective way to get that information across. So we talked about stuff teachers made. Now let's flip the coin and talk about student examples. The Ultimate Bedroom Design Project is a new project I started this year because I wanted to give kids um, a project where they're learning about budgeting, learning about screencasting, learning about spreadsheets, uh, drawings, drawing things to scale, and using a whole host of digital tools for that. So I rolled all these tools into one project. We called it the Ultimate Bedroom Design Project. They were to imagine that they won $40,000. And they could build on, as an extension of their home, or wherever they live, in a home apartment, whatever, um, a new bedroom that had whatever inside of it. And not just a bed and a dresser, but if you want the hot tub, if you want the vending machine, if you want the waterfall, you can do that because you have the money to do it. However, you, you have to build in the construction costs for it. So at $125 per square foot, it's roughly a Western New York construction cost, uh, you figure out how big you want to make this room, and the money that's left over, use that to buy all the goodies to go inside of it. So it was really nice that some of them wanted really huge rooms, and they realized, well, oh, i got no money left. I can't even buy a bed. But then other ones wanted to buy all this stuff, but they realized, well, I make the room so small, it won't all fit inside the room. So how would that work? So there's some, some deciding factors that had to go on into play here. This is about a three to four week project, um, all said and done when everything's in there. And the final result is make a presentation. Rather than stand in front of the class with the old-fashioned poster board and show here's all the things I did, 20-some kids in class, it kind of would take a long time to do that. So my theory was this is a perfect way to teach them screencasting. They're going to make a screencast and take us through a tour of all the pieces of the puzzle of their project. So they'll show us, uh, I'll show you more of us here, all the different things that they, um, went, uh, all the research that they did and what, what they decided on and why they decided. This is my survey that I made, which is really cool because you get, you get to make your own questions and you can do multiple choice, long answer, short answer, check boxes, what do you like? Scales, drop down questions, and little chart questions. And the results show up in a spreadsheet that looks like this, but this is kind of like a lot to look at. It's kind of gray, unorganized. So you can go to the summary sheet, which has all the all the responses in a nice little organized way. And we asked, what is the best for the laptop? And this was responded by Mac winning by 71%, which does not surprise me because everyone is very intrigued by the Apple company. And then we asked, what if so one thing you get is these little inflections, you know, the, their personalities kind of come through. And I tell them, make this a conversation. You're making this for someone that's not me, but for your mom or dad, or someone that's not in this class, so they could get the, the theory of what it is you're showing. Um, and you do get a lot of uh, personal inflections in there. And the, my room kind of sounds like a call center, like a help desk, because they're just all looking at their screens and they're talking. And some of them get a little uncomfortable because they're, they have to do that, and they've never done that before, talk to a screen. Um, and I do give them the option to do this from home if they choose. Because all the software we're using, even if it's paid software, you get 30-day free trial. So they can install it on their Mac or PC at home, and they can make it there. So those really shy kids that don't uh, really feel comfortable doing it in class, they, they do go home and they make them that way. And because then they store the finished product like this out on Edmodo or on a digital platform, they don't really have to bring it back and forth on a flash drive or burn a disk or anything like, like we used to have to do. the best movies to get what they posters should definitely be included. We got a variety of different answers, which means a variety of different people took the quiz. What size <laughs> bed do we get? The people said. So I'll stop there. I think you guys get the idea. That was a. Uh, I tell them they have up to five minutes to make their presentation. And usually most of them go right up to that amount of time. I'm only looking for maybe two, three minutes worth. But they, they give more because they know that well, I want to make sure I include that. And I spend a lot of time making my Evernote notebook with all the items I chose. And I want to make sure I say why I wanted the chocolate fountain for it. And so they'll elaborate a little bit more. So um, in my opinion, this is a better way to present rather than doing it live in front of the class because you get so much more when you can watch all of them at your own pace. Of course, they don't get the pressure of standing in front of an audience doing it this way. So we still do other things that we balance that off. Um, but this way was an alternative way of doing it the, from the traditional way of, of doing a, a poster type presentation. The next one I have for you is the iPod app reviews. This goes back, ooh, the blog even looks different. I may have to look for it because they may have changed it here. We're looking for for educators, we want to see the, the blog that is, I'm going to search for it instead. Um, jingproject.com is the shortcut. 
And I would think we have blog here somewhere. Oh, that's the TechSmith blog. Yeah, they've changed it since I made my outline here. But what I was going to show you was, maybe I can just search for it. Amherst? Yes, there it is. Okay. They did a story, uh, the TechSmith company, which makes a lot of the software I'm talking about here, back in January of last year, uh, did a little story about how we're using this IPVO web camera, which I have right here. This is a uh, $69 alternative document camera to something like this, which is probably around six, seven, eight hundred, a thousand dollars or so. This is nice and portable. I carried it with me today in my little carry case here. And this allows you to record. It's like a webcam. You can point it at something and record. And I'm going to use it a little bit later when I do some iPad stuff. And so the theory was the kids using screencasting software, they use Jing, could point this down at the tabletop and record the screen of, uh, of, of the surface of one of the apps. And they would have to make hey, this something like this. Now, before they could screencast, they had to create an outline for me. So I could see exactly the flow, the organization of what they wanted to talk about. We said, give the pros and the cons, how you obtain it, uh, things you think should be better about it, which then really was great because then we submitted, the kids submitted some of these to the app developers. And the app developers wrote back and said, yeah, you know what, that's a good idea. We never even thought of putting that feature in. Or we never thought that that would be such a struggle with that drop down instead of that, that click or whatever. So the kids made stuff, then got feedback from the actual app developers, and then Jing featured us on the Jing blog. And we've gotten a lot of good uh, mileage out of this here for our school, a lot of good, good positive PR for the kids, realizing that what they're making is actually stuff that people will be interested in seeing, not just the teacher, not just their fellow classmates, but the world. And we have collected them, put them in a public folder so that anybody could see. These are all apps, all iOS apps. Um, I tried to stick to just educationally based apps. Some of them, though, you'll see like Cash Cab. Um, there is Angry Birds in here somewhere. They had to convince me why the app would be educational, how it could be used by a teacher in a classroom. So <laughs> it was actually a good experience. The Shazam app was music about you play it when it's hearing the radio and it'll figure out the lyrics to the song or find the song or whatever. And I, had to, you know, I was like, well, how would that work? But then I guess a, a music teacher would use that. I mean, why, why, why wouldn't it work? So most of them in here uh, were very easy to justify of how it could be used by some K through 12 teacher in any curricular area. So the kids really enjoyed this project I did two years ago, and I'll be doing it again this uh, upcoming year. And we'll just keep adding on to it and going that extra step by saying, hey, we're going to send to the how to draw people, send it to the developers. Because we, we have their email addresses very easily online. And they can watch it and comment on it and get real feedback. Um, so that was a, a very popular project there was the iPod app reviews. And we're going to expand it now and just call it mobile device reviews because so many kids have access to Android tablets, the less expensive ones, and, and other devices too. It's basically just going to be a digital show and tell about something that could be used um, by teachers in school. And then this one around, this has a little story to go along with it. This is a... Uh, the project we're calling it is Teach the Teachers Project. The students are going to learn something. In my case, it's, we're bi getting big with uh, Gmail and Google Docs in our district because we now are a Google app school. The problem is the teachers are not all on board with it, but the kids are. And so my theory is let's have the kids make some trainings that they can make available online for the teachers to watch at their own uh, convenience and in a non-intimidating fashion because the kids aren't going to know what teachers are watching it and how often they're watching it or whatever. So we're putting it out there for people to, to watch it uh, at will that way. So I contacted uh, the TechSmith company because I wanted to get Snagit, the software that's, uh, and I do, uh, at the end I can hand these out too. There's trial versions on here if anybody's interested. You can get them online for free, but it's just the convenience of having it on a disk. Um, the, the Snagit product, which is $29, it was the end of the school year, and I knew I couldn't put in a request to, for the school to buy it. And so I just wanted the software, and I needed eight, dollars $900 to equip my whole lab with it. So I wrote to the company, and I said, um, you guys know what I did with the, the Jinx stuff, with the iPod app reviews. I have another idea for a project that will really showcase your, fe your, your stuff. If you just give me your software, I promise you'll get some mileage out of it, basically, like a kind of wheeling, dealing with them. And I told them what I'm going to do is make, have the students make these videos for the teachers to watch, and we'll call it Teach the Teachers Project. They said, okay. 
they gave me a license so I could install it up to 30 computers in my room. Then, a couple days later, I go home, get the mail, and I have a jury summons for grand jury duty. And I've never had jury duty ever in my life before. So this is the first time I got this. And I thought, oh, well, this is going to really mess up my plans now because I had this exciting project. I was going to run with this starting next week, and now I can't. So I emailed the Texan company. I said, well, you know what that idea I had, guys? I'm probably going to push it to next year or later down in the, in, in the, uh, in the timeline. And they said, well, why? I said, well, I got jury duty. I'm not going to be able to teach. And they said, what are you going to do on jury duty? How are your students going to learn? I said, oh, well, that's easy. They're going to do the bedroom design project because I did that last quarter, and I already made the screencast. They said, wait a minute. That sounds like it could be a good case study. It's going to be the teacher out of his class that's still teaching his kids, even though when he's not standing there in front of them. And I said, yeah, that, that sounds right. And they said, we're going to send someone out. So they sent someone from Michigan to my school. About, this was about a month ago. He followed me around for a day when I was there, because with grand jury duty, we had three days out and two days in, in school. Um, and he recorded me, interviewed me, interviewed a bunch of my students. And we even went to, and Buffalo people will know this, we were going to make it look like the court hall, but the court hall downtown wasn't really picturesque and a lot of trees and stuff. So we used a facade. We used the back of the Albright Knox um, art gallery because the columns and stuff looked very judicial. So we made, I, I had my briefcase. I was walking up there, the steps and everything, making it look like I was going in jury duty. Um, he put together a video, and I thought I would have it ready for today because actually right now they are in California. The ISTE convention is going on, which is the big um, once-a-year event, uh, which I, I was actually going to, but then this event came along and I ch kind of changed my plans. So he's putting that together to feature that there. So if I can get that by the end of the day today or if, if I see some of you tomorrow, I'll show that. Um, he's going to show it's about a five minute thing about how a teacher uses screencasting to reach his students when he's not there. Because even between sessions in jury duty, I was opening up my laptop and responding back to kids and uh, you know answering questions and things like that. So you can still be productive and some people say, well, they'll just take you out of the classroom. Well, you can't do that because I was still the one interacting with the kids, even though I wasn't face to face. You can't just hire someone for 10 grand and put in a, a teaching lab or a teaching assistant in my lab. It won't, you won't get the same output. So that always comes up. You know, they're just going to replace you, Rob. But I say it's, it's not really the case because I'm still doing the teaching. I'm still giving the feedback and developing material and, and assessing it as it comes back in. So that's the, the long story on, on, uh, on this one here. So Ben and Abby were my first guinea pigs. I always find the kids that work a little bit far ahead and get their assignments done. And I say, I have a new idea for a new project. Would you guys be willing to help me? And maybe even I'll give you an iPad to use for it during class time. And that usually is, it's a, makes a definite <laughs> yes for that. So Ben and Abby took the lead on this. I explained my vision of how I wanted to make a menu of videos for teachers to watch. And let's throw them all in a Google Doc, since it's kind of Google Doc training. So as you can see, step one, they're not actually steps, because they don't have to be done in any particular order. But how to create a document. If a teacher says, I've heard about this Google Docs thing, but I don't even know where to begin. Where do I go to create a document? They can simply click on the link, which takes them to the video that I think this one was made by Ben. And here's what it looks like. Go to Google Docs. On Google Docs, you can make document spreadsheets, presentation, drawings, and forms. I'm going to just log in right now. OK, so log in. Ah, I should mention something there. Notice you didn't see him log in? We tell the, the kids have learned, don't bore your viewers with something mundane, like typing in a username or a password or whatever. Just jump on to the next thing. And the beauty of screencasting is you can pause, hit the pause button, do whatever you got to do, and come back and unpause and record again. And the kids like that because it's less pressure. You're not forced to do everything in one breath and then forget what you're going to say next and wait, uh, what am I saying, and ums and ahs. You get rid of all that because you could just pause and unpause as you go. So that's why you didn't see Ben actually log in. I tell them, explain what you're going to do. And then pause it, do it, and then come back and unpause it. And you can hear the other kids talking in the background. That's kind of a, a busy classroom. It's what happens. <laughs> All right, so I'll pause it there. You can see lots of nitty gritty details he's getting into. He might actually, and this is how I envision it, he'll submit this and I'll look at it and I'll give like uh, some feedback. I'll say, you know what, Ben? It's too technical, you're showing too many things, maybe only show as far as making a document and typing in a sentence and just stop there. So I'll send him that feedback in Edmodo digitally. 
He'll then go back and re-record it and submit to me digitally the, fin the, the next version. So it's kind of like a great way uh, Edmodo serves as the platform to submit your rough drafts, get some feedback, uh, maybe get the power of the crowd. People in the, in the uh, class have to give comments on it too, and then you can refine your work. And that's really what I like about combining screencasting with Edmodo, which, as I mentioned this afternoon, I'll be talking more about that. Um, because then nothing exists on paper. Everything is just a living document that can be changed and crowdsourced and getting lots of feedback. And the kids really benefit when the feedback's coming from the classmates and not just directly from me. And it takes a lot more work off my shoulders, too, to, to have to see each and every specific one. So that was the learning how to create a document. Then I want to jump down here. Maybe this one might be from Abby, just so you can hear the difference between the, the male and the female voice here. They each have their own personalities. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Abby DeSico, and I'm going to show you how to make a floor plan. First, you go to Create. Then you go to Drawing. Now you end up with this blank thing. So you want to right-click this, Hit Background, and choose any color you want. So let's say I want it to be this. Now you can also change it too. So you can right click again, hit background, and change it. Let's say if I change my mind, I want it to be this color instead. So I'm going to fast forward here and see what she does next. Desk. Then we're going to change the Oh, and color. you can go full screen as well. I forgot. It is kind of nice to go full screen. And so my desk is brown. So I'm going to my desk. And then let's say that my bed is a different color. Let's say. All right, so that's the idea there. She's taking you through the, the steps involved in making that floor plan. And as you heard, I'm getting tangled here, um, the breathing no noises like that, her mic was too close. And that would be another one of those things where we would have her make it and plan on it, just being a rough edit, listen to it herself, and have others listen and comment on it, and then re-record it for the finalized version. Um, the USB headsets are the ones I recommend. This one happens to be a Plantronics brand. I like it because it's more compact. It can fit in my <laughs> laptop case. But the one I use in my classroom is the Microsoft LifeChat LX3000. The Microsoft LifeChat LX3000. If you Google that, you'll find uh, it's very popular. And it used to be like 30, 40 bucks. Now I've seen as little as 19.99. I think Amazon.com had, had a good price on it. And by having one of those plugged into every computer, you don't have to worry about installing drivers or doing anything like that that the older style headsets had that just had the plug-in um, eighth-inch stereo jack type connections. The digital ones like this that are USB, they have the, the drivers and everything you need. They're basically more plug-and-play, so they're more forgiving. Yes. The Microsoft LifeChat LX3000. And there's, there's models above and below that model, too. But th I kind of like that one for 20 bucks. I think it, it uh, stands up to good use. I, we have replaced a couple of them over the course of the school year. But for the most part, they have nice big ear cups, and they really surround their ears. Um, I don't really do much with cleaning them. Um, some teachers say they clean them weekly, monthly, whatever the case may be. But we did find the whole year, at least from what I can tell. Um, with, the, with the sanitary use of them. If the kids feel more comfortable using their own earbuds, a lot of them have their own iPods and such, I do let them use those and they can plug those in. However, that does not involve having a mic. So that was the one drawback to using that method. You kind of need the mic there so that you can do screencasts like that uh, uh, much easier. So that is my student example. Let's see where we're going next here. Do we have any questions before I move on? I'm kind of just plugging and chugging here, but I want to make sure at any time, if, if something comes up, you can stop me and, and ask questions. All right, so we looked at the student examples. Now let's look at actually how to create them. We're going to first focus on the Windows and Mac options. And the three that I'll cover, Jing, Snagit, and Camtasia Studio, they are all available for both platforms. So it doesn't matter which one you happen to be on. The Jing is the one I mentioned earlier. It is free. Jing Pro is going away in less than a year. They're kind of phasing that out. But from what the TechSmith guys and gals tell me, it'll, Jing will still be their entry level into screencasting so that anybody with a Mac or PC can download it for free and make up to five minute long screencasts uh, very easily. Negatives though, it only records to the SWF format, which is called Shockwave Flash. And that doesn't play nicely on all video editing programs and even any computers that do not have um, like Windows Media Player or QuickTime Player or things like that. So it's kind of a negative. Um, it's kind of what I use in a pinch, but I, I kind of this is what I call the good level. I like to re reinforce going to the better or the best level, which is Snagit or Camtasia Studio. So 
basically not much here I need to cover for you, but I just wanted to show you what the page looks like. It'll uh, give you some of the benefits of using Jing, the free product. And then we step up to the next one, and that one is called Snagit. Now Snagit is, more recently now, it can capture video. It used to be just for capturing photographs and drawing things on top of them, but now it can record video. Um, and that's actually similar to what I'm using right now. If I pull up my little toolbar there, you'll see I've been recording for the past 46 minutes, and I'm recording the entire screen surface here. I could set it up where I only want to capture maybe a certain portion of the screen, and that's fine too. And that might just be a small part on a, on a web page or a software product that you're demonstrating. But I'm recording the full screen, and it's going there, and I don't think I can run it two times. I don't think I can launch Snagit while I'm running this um, because it would interfere with it. But I can kind of give you the heads up on how it would work here. Um, once you record your videos, notice you can send it directly to YouTube. You could send it to the Camtasia, um, not the Camtasia, um, Screencast website. Uh, FTP is if you have your own servers, and you guys over there before mentioned your own servers. You, if you want to store stuff in your own locations, you can. But I'm a big fan of storing things out there on the screencast.com site. This is kind of the companion product that goes along with uh, Jing and Snagit and Camtasia. Now if I log in here to my account, you'll see every screencast or every screenshot that I've made probably in the past five years. They're all just saved for you here. Yeah, there's over a thousand items in here. But this is where I know that they are. So anywhere I go, from home or from school or here, as long as I can get online, I can get to any of my screencasts or screenshots that I made because they're stored up in the cloud. Don't have to carry a flash drive or a CD-ROM drive or a floppy disk or, or any of those media. Um, because it's all stored online here. And for example, if I wanted to pull one of them up here and give this to someone, everything is a link. So that link right at the top is just got to copy it and put it into Facebook, put it into an email message to somebody, put it whatever, because it all exists up on the web. The people watching it then do not need any special software. They just need to have simply a web browser. No, no software installed to play it. It just natively plays inside of their browser. <coughs> yes? They wouldn't even have to do it. I can show you my teacher web page here where I have that. I've done exactly that. Here's my home page here. So when, I, when I've gone into my, we use a school world. Is it school world, school wires? The school world, which the name has changed so many times. And we, could, we have the ability to put in either a web link or an embed code. Does everybody know what an embed code is? It's a little more high, high tech. Embed code is the actual um, HTTP code. It's like you know a, a thousand different characters all down. You just you look at it and it looks like a bunch of mumbo jumbo. But HTML code on a web page converts it into a player that you can look at right on your, on your site. So you could do one of two things. You could embed it like I did here so that your viewers can watch yeah, it right, right within their page. Or go the low tech way and just give simply a link like this where they would just click the link and it would take them off to, well in this case it's a website, but it would take them off to one of your videos. So you could do it either, either or. Let's go back. Um, either as an embedded video on your page or a link to it. But either way, the video is housed on screencast.com. That's where it lives. I could also put it on YouTube, but I don't do that a lot because most schools, they block YouTube for teachers and or students. So whenever I do that, people write back and say, hey, I can't get to your video. It's blocked. So I tend to um, put things on screencast.com because that's not blocked, at least in our school. Or the other one, and this is why I gave this to you guys earlier, is SchoolTube. Um, SchoolTube is a school safe alternative to YouTube. It's very similar in how it works. You upload your videos there and then people can watch them. But the videos get all tied together by school. So if you search Amherst Middle School, you'll see stuff from me and my students and other teachers in the building that have all uploaded stuff. And this is all free. There's no charge to use it whatsoever. Um, SchoolTube makes their money by giving you, they, they had SchoolTube premium channels where they would give you the ability to do like live newscasts and streaming and things like that. But I find most people I talk to, they don't need that. They just use the free portion of SchoolTube um, and they're able to use that as an alternative to YouTube. And one big thing that it says right on the front here is they've partnered with the National Association of Secondary School Principals and Elementary School Principals. And those are big organizations that a lot of administrators belong to. So if you're in the situation as a classroom teacher where your principal says, you know, I don't know if we want to put kids stuff online, 
that's always a good selling point. Realize that they have built uh, such a good reputation that the big um, administrator organizations are promoting the use of SchoolTube for student and teacher produced video. So you really have, I just gave you three options, YouTube, SchoolTube, or screencast.com as places to store your video. Okay, so those are, and there are more places too, but I like to say outsource it. Put it somewhere else on somebody else's server so you don't have to maintain it. And you don't have to worry about if it crashes, I have to fix it. Because if it's on SchoolTube or YouTube, they fix it. And I've never had more than a couple minutes of not being able to access something. So um, we've had a good, good track record with that. Did that answer your question? Okay. So back to our outline here, see where we left off. So we were talking about Snagit. Uh, as I said, that's the, that's the better, and then Camtasia Studio is the best. That's what I'm running right now to record my screen. But as you can see, it's a little bit more pricey. It's 179 And one of the reasons why it's so pricey is they give you all the features there, um, such as editing. Because if I made a screencast and I messed up, maybe I had a lot of ums and ahs and I wanted to chop them out, can't do that with Snagit or Jing. You just have to simply re-record, which in most cases is not a big deal because you're only making a couple minutes long. You're not making like an hour-long documentary, most likely. Um, but with Camtasia Studio, you have a timeline that you can drop that video on and then slice it and chop out bits of it and then pull those bits back together again. So really, once you get your feet wet with the Jing and Snagit tools, you kind of eventually say, you know what, I want to do more. I want to do this, I want to do that, and that's where you jump up to Camtasia Studio. And all those links are available right there from the um, outline if you're curious to look more at that. So now let's change over to the iPad and look at some of the options there. I know not everybody in the room said they have access to one yet, but hopefully with the trend of how iPads and mobile devices and tablets are making their way into schools, maybe they won't be an addition to the desktop computers, but they'll be a replacement to that. That's kind of my five to 10 year vision of how I see things going. If we're not gonna add them as additional, we're just gonna add them in place of. Um, so ScreenChomp is one I'll start with here. ScreenChomp is free. This is made by TechSmith, the same company we've been talking about today. And this one here, I shall switch over now to here. And I'm going to launch the iPad. Okay, let me go full screen on this. And I'll switch over so we get a better view here. All right, ScreenChomp. It's basically a whiteboarding app, records your voice. And you can see you get three different pens across the bottom there you can use. So for example, let's say I'm gonna do a little, math is always an easy one for me to do here uh, for a demonstration. So let's record a little math demonstration. It'll count down for me. Hi, this is Mr. Z, and today I'm gonna to talk about a math calculation. If we say 2x plus three equals 12. Now what would the X stand for? Let's see if we can figure that out. I'm going to switch colors. First we need to subtract out this. And then that leaves me with 2X equals 9. And from here we would divide, uh-oh. I just lost power on that. At least I can still show you this way, okay. And then, and so forth. So you get the idea, we just do our math that way. So uh, everything I've been saying has been recording. Look in the upper right hand corner, you can see the time going up there. So I'll say stop. And I don't know if I have audio on though. Let me turn it up here. Equals 12. Now what would the X stand for? Let's see if we can figure that out. I'm gonna switch colors. First we need to subtract out. So we have this talking voice, we have the drawings on the screen. Now what we do with this is we simply go to share it. And I can hit my screen chomp button and it'll send it up to, um, to cloud storage, to, to a place online that's gonna give us um, a link. Or I could also, this one of the programs allows you to email. I'm not sure if it's this one or the next one I'm gonna show you, but you could also share things out through email as well. Um, and when you go up to this little guy here, and you go to draw and record, it's under here. It says it's preparing the video to share. So that's, it's actually still uploading it at this moment right now. So it does take a few moments to do that, but when it's done, here's a previous one I've made. You then can watch it either directly on the screen from this app or you can watch it at screenchomp.com. So you would um, send people there if they don't have access to the iPads. A similar, similar one here I did. All right, 
right, so there's a, a mathematical example there. And that one is called Screen Chomp. Oh, there it goes. So it says that last one was done. So let me go to another one. I think what happened with my computer here is that when it gets hot, it shuts down. So that's not a... Uh, we're going to do everything on the iPad, I guess, then. We're going to switch gears here. But that's okay, because that's kind of where I was at anyways. All right, another one I want to show you that is free is called Show Me. Um, this one I'll have to just explain because I haven't upgraded my account yet. This one they make, it's a little more tedious because you have to create an account first. And I don't like anything that you have to create an account because it kind of slows down the progress in class. But you can use your Facebook or Twitter account information or uh, sign up through email. You'll create an account. And the reason why is they want to email you or they want to contact you and say, your screencast is now ready. Here it is. Here's the link to it. So they kind of <laughs> give you the heads up on the information rather than you going out and searching for it. Um, and that's, that's kind of the idea behind that. So Show Me and Screen Chomp are the entry level free apps that would do screencasting. Now we take it up another level. Edu Creations. I'm not sure if they call it Edu Creations or EDU Creations. This one I only came across about a week and a half ago. Um, and I like this because now they're, they're taking what the other guys did with the Screen Chomp and, and uh, Show Me, but they're making lessons involved where you can now have ability to see how many students looked at this and when did they look at it and you can build in questions like assessment questions at the end like multiple choice questions so they're making more of a lesson plan out of the whiteboarding concept where you have ability to see when people watched it which are the popular ones uh, more more analytics that way of, of what's going on but the same idea here is it's it's a whiteboarding app so you can draw with the markers and you get different colors um, you can add text this they just added a couple days ago I saw tap anywhere to add some text so you can see uh, so not everything has to be scribbled handwriting. You can draw text, and then you can move it around on the screen. Um, if you want to grab a camera photo, you can take a picture with your device, grab something from Photos, Dropbox, or the web. And the web is kind of neat, because I did this before. Let's say we're in a science class, and we're doing the valves of the heart. This has a built-in browser, so I can, of course, search for heart, and you see a variety there. But the one I'm more looking for would be something maybe like this. So I want to get this graphic in here, and then it'll, it's going to let me resize it and I can draw right on top of it. I can wipe things out so I can uh, get rid of the names and have students tell me the names. And uh, just using your finger there, you can resize it like so. And then when you delete, you can clear the whole page or just the ink. So the ink is just the stuff you use to draw on top of it. Hit that and say just the ink, and then it keeps that image up there. That's kind of a nice feature, because the other ones, once you would hit delete, it would just say clear page and everything would be gone. This one works nicely too. If you notice in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a next button. So I could record slide number one and then stop, make a new slide, record on that. So you basically have slides you're working on, not just one screen, but many screens in a row. That would be great for doing multiple step pro uh, 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 de demonstrations or activities. And so that one is called EDU Creations or Edu Creations. Now for the top of the top, and we're only talking $2.99, so $3 here for it. This one is called Explain Everything. This one I like because it does the same idea where you have multiple slides to work on, and it will record all the movement that you do as you're doing it. So, for example, let's see, I think I recorded here. It'll start in the beginning. Hit record. Hi, this is Mr. Z, and today I want to show you some information about the states. This state right here, it's a pretty big one, is called Texas. Now let's look for California. Which one is California? Is it here? Oh, i got to get back to that. Is it here? No, nope, it's not there. It's this one. So I want to do some movement here to show you guys that it moves too. Um, you can pull up a browser, which would be, let's see here. There you go. You can insert images from a host of many different places. Or you can even insert a web browser. And then let's say I'll go to my blog site. And all this right now is being recorded live as we do it. And so you could demonstrate things that are on web pages. Now, I thought this would be really cool then to pull up maybe a YouTube video and draw on top of that, but that's the catch. It will not let you record moving video. It will just record um, web pages that are static like this, that are not moving. But you could still do your annotations on top. You could hold down your red laser pointer tool. Um, you could use your arrows and such that way. I think if you touch and hold, yeah, there you go. You get more choices that way for shapes and colors and things like that. So you really can go crazy with the... Uh, options here and draw things and move things and whatnot and so let's stop it there hit rewind hit play Hi, and, 
and you'll see all the stuff that I just did. So it includes all that mo motion and movement that you did before. Then if you're ready to send it out, in the bottom right hand corner, you would hit the export button and notice all the options you have to export it. You could send it right to your, your photo roll or your camera roll, which basically means local storage, just keeping it on your device. Um, then from there you can pull it into other places. I've even pulled it into iMovie so it could add nice titles and, and soundtracks and things like that. So it is any app that lets you do that, in my opinion, that lets you go to the photo roll makes it a very versatile app because that means they're letting you take your creation and use it elsewhere on your iPad, not just in their own app. Um, of course, there's YouTube, email, Dropbox, Evernote, Box is another storage thing. Um, that list grows all the time. It seems like they're always adding more integration in with it, um, which is why I would think it's a paid app for $3. Um, but does everyone know about the educational discounts we get at schools, the volume licensing? Apple did this and really didn't make a big deal out of it. Schools that have multiple iPads um, that we should say buy it the legal way where you're buying a copy for each and every device because not everyone does that. And there's ways to get around that, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> they're allowing it, the volume purchasing program goes for half price. So if it's a $3 app, it's actually now $1.50 for all the ones you do. And that's a big deal for like this, in science class, they have the uh, periodic table, uh, elements table, and that's a $15 app. So getting that for $7.50 is, in my opinion, way better than you could do in any handout or any textbook showing actual periodic elements and spinning them around and looking at how gold works and tungsten, the bulb lights up and all that. Um, the a Apple is doing what they can to try to get into the education market and make things more affordable because they know the device itself is not cheap. You're going to spend a lot of money on this, but then hopefully you have lower priced apps to, to, to do more with that. Um, so that is the Explain Everything app. And that one is kind of developed to be my favorite. You kind of get your feet wet with the free ones and then you start using the, um, the more advanced ones. Now I did mention earlier, drawing, or a few moments ago, drawing on top of YouTube videos. There is some times where you want to be able to draw on top of some motion video. Even if, and I look at most likely a phys ed class would be a perfect example of this. Um, let's say someone is doing a push up on the ground and you want to draw on top of it and show is their body straight or are they angled or are they bent like this or even doing a jumping jack do the hands meet at the same time that the feet are open you can do that in slow motion and that's called telestration we see this all the time on if you watch a hockey game a basketball game and the sportscasters they draw on top of the screen you can do that now with the iPad with a, another favorite app of mine called Coach's Eye Coach's Eye is made from the TechSmith company the one I've been talking a lot about today this one is a $5 app, and it exists on both iPad and iPhone. So if you have your iPhone with you, or even an iPod Touch, and you go out in a sports field, like my daughter's softball thing I, I was doing recently, <laughs> you can do the same kind of telestration that the pros do um, by, by drawing like that. So let's, let's do an example and show you how that could work here. This is, we'll go, this is my backyard here, and my son was swinging the bat here. So the video itself looks like this. Okay, so let's say I wanted to draw and show him how he was swinging in the beginning there when he missed the, the, uh, the ball there. We'll go to the Analyze button, and it drops it in, and I get this little bar at the bottom where I can go forwards and backwards by scrubbing the, you, know, you guys can't see it because you're not seeing my finger, but I was grabbing this right here and sliding it left and right. I also have drawing tools where I can draw on top of the screen, and it uses the microphone because it records my voice as I'm talking. So now you can really make a true tele uh, uh, newscaster style presentation uh, sportscaster like this I'm gonna go record hello this is Mr. Z and today we're gonna show how Owen swung the bat and he kinda swings it a top to bottom fashion instead of a cross now notice right about there I'm gonna draw with my line here there's a line going right like that so he's kinda swinging along that line now what we would like to see clear that is I'm gonna change colors of staying horizontal with the with the line so as he's swinging he might not realize it but he's going kind of high there and of course being three years old <laughs> he might not understand the concept of what I'm trying to explain here but my five-year-old does and it, it was kind of neat she was doing she learned how to do jumping jacks in her phys ed class and and so we did a clip of that so that's my recording I'll hit stop and let's see how I guess I can play it back like preview Okay, so when you hit preview then, that's when it does it. It takes a few moments because it has to compile your drawings, your audio narration, and the video clip together. Puts it all together, and then it's something that you can share out 
with the world or with one person if you send them a, a link to the to the video that lives online it's taking a little bit longer than I thought but it, it's probably because I recorded this video clip in very high definition so it was very crisp and clear so you do have the ability to record your footage in the app or you can record it in any other app that's on your uh, iOS device and then pull that footage into this program so they've done a good job with this making uh, telestration possible on an iPad or an iPhone or an iPod and I showed this to our phys ed department at Amherst Middle School and they actually wrote a grant to try to get a few iPod touches for the kids uh, for the fitness center because they want them to be able to record when they're doing push-ups or doing anything physical where they think they're doing it a certain way but until they see themselves um, it, you know they, they get a different picture of that and it really helps someone uh, get that kind of valuable feedback Hello, this is Mr. and there it goes now So I'll stop it there. We get the idea of that one. And uh, let's go back and see. Do I have? Yeah, I have the jumping jack one, but let's see. They sort it out by things you've analyzed already. So this is one I did. Let's just see what it looks like here. The jumping jack example. Oop, wrong one. Go back and preview. We are now recording Oakley, and we're going to play it in slow motion so you can see how she does her jumping jacks. Everybody, let's take a look. There she looks. She brings her feet together and her hands up. We're going to go like this. We're going to go again to where she landed. Notice that where her feet are, right about here and here. Okay, those feet are touching the ground. Now, as I go forwards a little bit, you'll see she jumps up in the air, and she brings these feet together right like that nicely. Okay? Now, as you keep going, you'll see her hands are up wide, and she makes the five-pointed star. So we have a line here and a line here. Now, I had her do this then. After she saw me do a telestration example, I had her do it. I just... I. I don't have it on here, and I wish I did to show you guys, but it's like hearing the kids explain it in their own words and watching themselves is, is much more powerful than having someone else explain it. Um, so that is the Coach's Eye app that uh, was recently redone because there was only one version before, an iPhone version, but now they made an iPad version, which made it even uh, nicer with the, with the large screen. And that is a $5 app in the App Store. Um, let me go back to here now. And we'll look at our outline on this screen here. Yeah, that's what happened with my laptop. That's probably um, yeah, one of the worst things that can happen in a presentation. It gets so hot because there's two hard drives in this laptop, it just quits. Um, but just this morning, the FedEx man brought something very special to my house. And that is uh, my first ever. I've never owned a MacBook before. So I have a MacBook Pro Retina coming, well, uh, delivered this morning. I was hoping to have it for this event so I could do a lot more stuff with um, demonstrating iPads on a MacBook is so much easier than messing around with the Windows machine. Um, but I'm kind of becoming a Mac fanboy and getting away from the world of Windows just because I've <coughs> fell in love with the iPad so much. But going back to where I wanted to go next with you guys here, we did Coach's Eye, Explain Everything. All right, so how to view them, number six here. As I've been mentioning, you can email somebody a link, and that's probably the dead easiest way to do it because most everybody is familiar with email. They don't need to have any special software installed. They just check their email, and they click on that link, and that's the easiest way to send it. You can place it on a web page or a blog, like you saw I did on my teacher web page. I had that one video there, or on my blog site. I've had shown you guys a bunch of videos there. Post it on a digital learning platform, or LMS, for example, Edmodo, which I mentioned earlier, or Moodle is another one that some are familiar with, or simply Facebook but you're probably not using Facebook in the classroom. But that kind of idea where it lives out on a, on a platform where someone can look at it right now or a week from now or a year from now. Whenever they're interested and want to know about it, they know where to go to get that information. Um, my favorite, though, my preferred method is that Google Doc menu because as I showed you with the Ben and Abby example there, you really have one place where you could put links to all those videos. So I, I like to chunk things in small bits and pieces there, not one long video, but small pieces. And you get that step one, step two, step three ability um, in, a, in a Google Doc like I showed you guys before. An Evernote digital notebook. Let me see what I meant by that because I'm not remembering what I put that there for. Oh, this is just an example one. Same idea. Um, Evernote, has anybody used Evernote before? Okay, this is a one hour presentation tomorrow that I've been asked to do here. Evernote is one of those tools that I couldn't live without. I compare it to, and you, if those of you, if you see it tomorrow, to a junk drawer. 
We all have a junk drawer in our house because it's the place we've just put stuff that we'll probably need later. And we know when we need it, it's probably in the junk drawer, just go there for it. That, this Evernote is the same concept, but for information. So if I need to know what's the password for my router at home, or when was the last time I did jury duty because I threw that paper out and I don't know where I put it, or when did I get an oil change the last time, I just throw that into Evernote because then I know I can just search a word and it comes up with my result instantly. I could just simply use it to take pictures of everything. And anything I take a picture of, take a picture of this book, and I can search for the word schools. And then boom, this picture will come up with this outlined in yellow. It'll actually look for the words in a photograph and, and make them uh, recognizable. You could do it with handwriting. Handwrite on a piece of paper, just take a shot of it. Now every word you wrote on that piece of paper, or on a whiteboard somewhere, or on a chalkboard, that's all searchable text. And Evernote lets you do that. Evernote works with your mobile device, with your iPad, desktop, laptop, you name it, whatever. There's an app for all these devices, and that's uh, what it works for. So I had my students do an Evernote activity for the bedroom design project, and they were figuring out what do they want to spend their money on for this ultimate bedroom design. They would go out there, and instead of bookmarking pages, they used Evernote to clip things from the web. Clipping, in my opinion, is better than bookmarking, because when you clip something, it automatically takes the link name at the top, the date and the time, and um, ties them all together. So if it was a water fountain, all the clips we made that were, had water fountain, we didn't do a thing. They just tagged them for us automatically, and they put them all together. So it's like a high-tech way of bookmarking um, is what this activity was all about. And so that was just an example of showing you all the steps there. Notice there was 12 steps, so this is kind of a big assignment. But without me having to stand and lecture in front of the class like I'm doing right now, all of my instruction comes through this method. And when a student, and this happens, they go up and say, um, how do I, I don't know how to create a new notebook. I, I know I have to do that, but how do I do that? Will you show me? And I say, did you look yet? They say, no, I didn't look yet. And I say, well, how do I teach you? And they say, oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. And then they go to the video and they say, okay, where is it? Okay, create a notebook. That's this one. They click it, they watch it, and they learn it. So that learning happens right at that moment in time when they're ready for it. Rather than me saying, here's what we're going to do next week, Thursday, or you, some of you will get to this point sooner than others, they just learn it as they need it, rather than me doing a live lecture. Some students are changed by that because they're so used to getting spoon-fed by the teacher, and they say, I have a question I don't know, so I ask the question, the teacher tells me the answer, and I solve the task. But I say, if I do that, I'm not being a good teacher because I'm not going to follow you around for the rest of your lives. You have to learn to live without teachers and adults in your life because you've got to do it on your own. So we say that's a transfer of ownership. They own the learning in the classroom instead of me owning the learning. They own the pace of the class rather than me owning the pace. And as long as we get to the end of that 10 weeks and they get all their assignments turned in on time, they can get a perfect 100% score in my class. Everything I do now assignment-wise, and this is more for the, the afternoon presentation, is done electronically so I can tell when they turn stuff in. And even if there's one little spelling mistake, I won't give them 100%. I'll give them a zero. And if they want a 100, they have to fix it. And so they definitely don't want a zero in the grade book. So they'll fix that assignment, resubmit it. takes me seconds. I look at it. Oh, they fixed it. Okay, put it now in as 100. And as long as it's all on time, everything in my class is 100%. But each day something is late, you lose a point each day it's late. So that's the one catch. That's why not everybody gets 100 in class, because they turn stuff in late. But as long as it's done on time, even if there's mistakes, I'll just let them keep returning stuff in again. And I could not do that on paper. The old-fashioned way before Edmodo and before all the digital stuff, I couldn't do that. But now I can have them be masters of the learning rather than, you know, turn in this is good enough kind of thing. Uh, but that's, I'm, I'm going on a sidetrack there because it's more for this afternoon. Um, but that is the idea behind the Evernote and the whole um, menu type system like that. The screencast project, just wanted to show you what the kids see when they're making their very first ever screencast. Um, they, I, I like to always start off by watching an, an example first. So they'll watch the one that we saw earlier from, was it Abby? I forget who it was. Mora. It was from Mora. Um, I, I kind of picked the best of the best on purpose, and I tell them that, and I say, yours could be up here too someday. But uh, Maura did a really good job with her, so I, I force them to watch a good example of it, and I say, model yours after that. Then they create an account at screencast.com, which is what you guys can do too if you're interested in jumping into this. The easiest way to get started with using Snagit or Camtasia or any of those products is to go directly first to screencast.com, sign up by using your email address, then they will email you stuff like, hey, we'll give you this free, or you can download this free, or special offer we're offering for the next three months or something. And they will, you have to kind of get used to that. They'll send you stuff because it, the goal is to uh, kind of get in your face with it so you realize, I didn't realize I could try that for free for instead of 30 days, I get it for 90 days. Okay, I'm more comfortable with that, so I'll do that. And that's what I hear a lot of my fellow teachers saying too, that they feel like 30 days is not enough time to get their hands on a product, because what if I get busy? But they, they do that. They say, like, oh, we'll give you 90 days or 120 days or, you know, stuff like that to, to entice people to try their products there. Um, so you can, you can jump in there. 
this is the stuff I have the kids arrange on the screen. There, there are four different tabs, and then I tell them always record a three-second check whenever you make a screencast. And we have a little red light on our, uh, where's the headset? Right here. There's a red light that shows up because I have learned this the hard way many, many times. I just assume that the mic is ready to go. So I tell them record a three-second check and just say, testing one, two, three. This is Mr. Z to see if it works. Thanks, bye-bye. Hit stop. And now play it back. If you hear it working, then everything is fine. And now do your five minute long screencast or whatever the case is. So I kind of train them to do that from my uh, misfortunes of all the time just assuming it's plugged in. It worked last time. It'll work this time. I always do a little three second check like that. And then they record their screencast. Typically, they record three to four to five times before they're even happy with it. Some kids will go many days in a row where they're just perfectionists and they say, oh, I, I say to um too many times. You know, people are going to hear that. And I tell them, you can't be a perfectionist because even I am not. I, I, I've been doing this for years. You just have to get to the point where you're happy with your presentation and move on and realize that you do the best you can. This is meant to be a, a casual conversation and not a formal radio style presentation. Um, and that eases their nerves a little bit. Also, the fact knowing they can pause as they go, that helps them too to, to not get stressed about uh, hearing their voice recorded. And so that's what the, that project looks like for the uh, screencasting project. So now, do we have a volunteer from the audience who would like to do a screencast? I always like to, at the end, give someone the chance to do that because I feel like it's just me showing stuff and I've been doing this for a while. I want someone that's never done this before to maybe do like a 20 second screencast of maybe something we can draw with our finger like a math problem is a pretty easy example. Would anybody like to do that? Any takers? No takers? We can skip that part if we need to. <laughs> all right, everybody's watching instead of a, uh, we, we won't jump into that, that's okay, that's all right. Okay, so back to my essential questions now, just to kind of wrap things up. The three things I want to make sure everybody understands um, before they walk out is number one, what is a screencast and a screenshot? Who can tell us what is the screencast? The last, it's the last part of the week. It's the video, right, and the screenshot is the? the picture right most of the time you're doing for lessons you're doing screencasts but every once in a while if it's just showing what a screen looks like a screenshot suffices and you don't have to put on the headphones and do all that um, how do you create them many different ways what are some of those ways Jing Snagit Camtasia what about the iPad apps you remember those screen chomp show me coaches app Explain everything. Educreation. Edu uh, yes, educreation. Edu yes, educreation. That one's new to me. I still don't have it burned in my, main, my mind yet. But that one I kind of am leaning more towards for the free ones. Um, and then the third one, how do you view them? How do you get them to your viewing audience? Email a link. Email a link. Blog, Edmodo, or a platform, a digital platform. School tube. You can upload them there. Screencast.com. YouTube is another place, as long as it's not blocked. Oh, and another one, too, I realize, is Google Docs. Has anybody used Google Docs? Google Docs is now kind of called Google Drive. It's a, Google renamed it. Google Docs are in Google Drive. It's kind of hard to get them all straight. But what I like now is, just like this is we're looking at a Google Doc, you can upload a video in Google Docs. It'll make it playable, so it looks like a YouTube video. But it has all the advantages of the control factor of who gets to see it. The public or a certain few people or one person or private, you get to control the access level to it. And there in Google Docs, it's unlimited views and practically unlimited storage. You'd be hard pressed to really fill up your storage uh, for, for what they give us for schools. So that is another alternative to not using YouTube. You could put it into Google Docs and share that out to just your class or your administrators or whatever the case is. And that was a new thing I just discovered a, a little bit ago. All right, so if there's no other questions, that's what I have for you guys. We'll get you out a little bit early today so you can get over for the, the nice lunch that I hear they have prepared for us. So does anybody have any last minute questions, any remaining questions? Yes? Um, what sort of problems do you, with having your classes sort of built into a working at home, um, like hardware issues on their end, like if mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I do is I figure out how many we talk in that don't have access to a computer or internet at home. And chances are for us, 
it's like less than 10%. We have over 90% now have access to something, even if it's from a friend's house or mom or dad's house, if it's a shared custody thing or from a library. Um, but I make sure I don't assign something today that is due tomorrow. Everything I assign has at least a week, if not more, of lead time in advance so they can plan that out to, to get their access. Um, they also can come in early in school. Our computer labs are open, so if they need to, they have time before and after school. They have computer time. Um, but I guess that's the key for me is don't assign something today expecting to have them have it done for tomorrow. And that's why in certain curricular areas, that's kind of the teaching style they have now is they show a problem in class and expect them to do the homework tonight and come back in and talk tomorrow. So you would have to have a little bit more adv advanced planning, I would, I would think, to make sure that they would, you know, lesson number five is complete by next Thursday. So they have some lead time. That one, all the, it's about a, a four-week project, and there's probably about seven or eight individual assignments within that. And when I release an assignment like the, uh, bed, let's say, the bedroom size spreadsheet, that's your first introduction to spreadsheets, I'll release it, today is Tuesday, so I'll say it's due on Friday, or it's due by next week Monday, or due by next week Tuesday. They could start it in class today, or start it in a few classes from today, but as long as it's in by that deadline, they get the full credit for it. And all the teaching of how to do that at all is covered through screencasts. Do you do every day? Uh, my students, I do, yes. Yes, but I know in some places of the full classroom they don't, where it's like an every other day type thing or a block schedule thing. Um, I guess the theory there is if they're not going to meet with you, they have to have allocated time to use to watch your screencasts. You can't really say, just do it all at home. Because if the kid has eight or nine teachers and they all say that, now homework that used to be half hour, 45 minutes, is now like many hours at home because it's just all going there. So that's the challenge is to figure out in school, if you're not going to have the seek time requirement, do they get computer lab time or they get some open time where they can do that? All, all good considerations. And I know a lot of it's covered in here. That's why I'm eager to start reading this one. It's a nice short read, too, which is nice. Um, but this one is being promoted very heavily by ISD and by ASCD um, organizations. So, if you're interested in the flip classroom, just Google it, and you'll you'll see that. You know, it's, I think it's only about twelve bucks or so. Other questions, concerns, comments? Anything you can think of regarding flip classroom or screencasting, or Apple devices or tablets? Um, no, and I'm kind of glad you brought that up too because I. I allow my students to have free time on the computers because they don't get that in any other class and they want to do that if they're all caught up for whatever is due from now. Future assignments, they don't have to necessarily jump onto them, but I let them have free time. And since they know that's a privilege I allow them to have, they know that can easily be pulled away by if they were off task, which is why I use another tool, Class Dojo. Anybody ever hear of Class Dojo? I should have put that on to, to present here uh, today or tomorrow. Too. That's a really good one too. Class Dojo is a free site. It's a behavior management tool. So when you launch the site, it's web-based. So imagine this is the web page. You'd have like a little seating chart across the, the screen. And you could tap a name and say Johnny and then say out of seat. And it'll be a negative minus one. And then Sally, good answer. And Johnny, Susie, and Jimmy uh, working together, good answer. It's a plus. So it's like a plus and a minus system. Kind of like uh, my daughter in kindergarten had the the card color thing, or if it was a good day, she was a green card, but if she misbehaved, it'd be yellow, then blue, then red kind of thing. This is more of the high-tech way of doing that. And uh, the uh, Class Dojo works from a web interface, but it also works from a smartphone. So I know elementary school teachers that will have a smartphone device, and I don't know if I have the app on here or not. It's, it's, it's just a web service, so you don't really even need an app, but they have it on their screen, so it's a smaller image of all the kids' names. So they could touch this one, out of seat, you know, negative. This one, good job. And they can just track stuff over time. And the kids now have the ability to log in themselves and see their history of how they've been good and bad. And those can be emailed to the parents, too. And so it's kind of a way of tracking things that we mentally just track in our minds, but now we can actually have data to show for it. And I was using it for attendance. Kids would walk in the room, and they would go right to the... Let's see if I even have it here. I probably do. A little shortcut to it. I might be logged in, though. And I would leave my iPad up near my desk, and they would come over and find their name. Yeah, I'm not logged in. And it would just basically just squares on the screen. They would touch their name, and it would, then they would hit attendance, and it would make a little, like, da-ding sound. And then every kid would walk in and, and do that, and then I would be hearing as they're walking in that noise, and I would know that it's time to 
uh, finish up my conversation maybe with the students that were in there before, and move on to the next group. So it's kind of like automated my classroom in a way where I don't have to stand in front of them and do roll call. They check themselves in through Class Dojo. And then if someone's not there, I actually have my attendance records all set. I can go back and look and see when someone was absent and didn't check in. So that's another free service that's out there that they are working very feverishly over the summer on because um, I've talked to the developers about it because they like to listen from teachers and say what's working and what doesn't work. And I asked them to have more of a, of a attendance type thing where it dims out the person when they're not there so you can't accidentally give them a point. If the whole class did something good and you want to give everyone a point, you won't give a point to someone that wasn't there kind of thing. So small, minor things like that, little tweaks. Um, they're open to listening to teacher suggestions. And a lot of these companies, Class Dojo, um, a lot of the screencasting ones, Edmodo, they all have big plans for September launches. They keep saying, you know, we're going to roll out our next version with all these things. So I think we're in a very interesting time now, having access to all these free services. <coughs> Just the challenge for us as the educators is we need our hands to head be on these things. We need these things to access them. So once you have those things, you don't have to buy the software and buy things for them. You can just uh, use stuff that's available out there. Other concerns, questions, or comments? Do you have the camera, the IP Vivo? The IP Vivo camera? Yep. Is that a USB hookup? Yes, it is. Yep. And actually, it is plug and play. They have their own software, but you don't need it because it'll still work without it on a Windows or Mac computer. Um, this is the IP Vivo. It's $69. They've now upgraded us, uh, uh, made an additional model called the Ziggy. And our district just bought one for every teacher's classroom, every teacher that has a projector. That is $89, so it's 20 bucks more. But for that, you get a taller stand so that when you have it on a tabletop, you can have it high enough to see a full 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper underneath it. Um, it also has some more onboard controls, so some more buttons to control like uh, brightness and darkness and things like that. Um, and so I, I really like that a lot, more so than this one even. It's, it's worth the extra 20 bucks. And it really takes the place of one of these things here, which you know, as an older technology, these, these things work well, but they're really not that portable, and they're very expensive. So these little guys here, the Ziggy and the IPVO camera, uh, make it much more affordable to have a document camera. It works cross-platform to a Mac or PC, it'll work on. And combine that with your screencasting, and now you have a way to actually record anything that you're drawing by hand or, or, or operating or demonstrating or doing a show and tell. Um, I haven't because we don't have any smart boards in our district. We, we have, I think, four for the whole Amherst district. And that's okay because I'm not really a fan of the smart board because I have used the iPad in place of that, and that's in my hands, and I can see on the screen here and walk around the room wirelessly with it because there are some apps you can use that have smart board-like capability. And one of them is, I really can't show it because it has to combine with a, a Windows computer, but at least I have the app here. It's called Dosiri. And if my laptop was on and active right now, I'd be, and I was on the same Wi-Fi, that's how these things have to work, on the same Wi-Fi network, I would touch this, and now I'm remote controlling my Windows computer from the screen of the iPad. And I'm screencasting, because it'll record my voice and all of my annotations and things I'm drawing. So that's another way of screencasting, of capturing your lecture, your demonstration you did, and archiving that online somewhere. So someone can watch it. Kids that were absent could watch it. Or even if you teach multiple periods in a row, first period you do the math demonstrations, second period now you're just replaying what you did and there's actually stop points. So after you draw the equation out, you make that a stop point. And then you do line two make that a stop point. So then the kids can actually on their own even too, step one, step two, step three, and they can navigate themselves through each stop point and see the progression of say a, a mathematical equation being written up or annotations going on top of a drawing that's on the screen or, or a diagram or something. So there are ways to um, be smart board free by using your iPad for that. And then you just simply invest less money by having a projector and a screen like this rather than spending thousands on smart boards. And I know one school that had to spend extra money on the smart board because they had uh, handicapped students or kids with special needs in wheelchairs in the class and this wouldn't work for them because they couldn't see it so they had to spend I think a thousand bucks more or so to get this to come out and go down and then readjust the optics and everything like that and I'm thinking that's you know four or five thousand dollars for that classroom when a $500 iPad could be used by handing it to the kid and seeing what you're drawing on in the screen and recording it too, all built in. So, but if you do have a smart board, and a lot of schools invested in that, you can simply use a screencasting program to record the entire screen as you're doing your thing, and it will record everything that you drew and everything that's visible on the screen. You just have to figure out a way to capture your audio though. So maybe a, a, a clip-on mic or something that would plug into the computer.
Wireless would be better, but that'd probably be more expensive to try to do some sort of wireless situation in here. Any other ideas, concerns, questions, comments? OK, I thank you guys for coming. And as I said, I'll try to put this online if it's available, the video. And uh, you guys can head over to lunch a little bit early.